it's my pleasure to introduce the first uh, speaker of the, the conference, uh, Professor Lisa Kaltenegger. Uh, in addition to being an expert in all things exoplanets, their detection, characterization, uh, their potential habitability, uh, Professor Kaltenegger is an associate professor of astronomy at Cornell University. She's also the founder and current director of the Carl Sagan Institute uh, at Cornell. Uh, and she will be giving the eponymous uh, presentation uh, keynote uh, of the conference um, on uh, life in the universe, our past, present, and, and future. So with that, uh, Professor Kaltenegger, please. Thank you very much, Andrew. And thank you very much for having me here. It is a pleasure to actually introduce this whole conference. And I loved watching it last year. So I'm excited to be part of this this year. And as you all know, today, actually, we will see a huge conglomerate that brings together our knowledge of our Earth, about the microbial world, and it will let us imagine how different worlds can be out there. So what I would like to do is to give you a taste about what we've learned, how we're trying to find life in the universe, and then tomorrow you will get an idea about our future selves that Martin Rees will uh, introduce, and then you'll get the vision of NASA and ESA and our search in our solar system. So today I will focus on what we've learned on our Earth and how we use that to search for signatures of life on planets that orbit not our star, but other ones. And as you know, we have thousands of those detected already. So the idea of the 4.5 billion years of solitude, how much longer it's gonna go on is I think why we all here. It is fascinating to me as a scientist, but also just as a mere mortal, to live in the time where we have the technological means to start searching these new worlds on our cosmic horizon for signs of life. And don't get me wrong, this is going to be incredibly hard. We'll need everything we know of Earth's past, present, and what we can imagine about the future, and the other planets in our solar system to get a handle on what we are looking for. And so what you see here is just the first imagination of other red dots, green dots, yellow dots. And this is all the Earth and my artistic renderings of how life with other kind of, how planets with other kind of life might appear to us. And the question is, how might they appear to our telescopes? So you know that we have about 4,000, nearly 5,000 now, planets that we know orbit other stars. And most of them we have found with two distinct methods. One, where we look at the wobble of the star, that's the animation you just saw, the radio velocity method. And the other method is when we look at the star and we see it be a little bit less bright, just temporarily. Here you see the brightness dip while the planet blocks out part of the really hot stellar surface. So the radio velocity methods where we see the star move because of the gravitational tug of the planet, and the transit method, where you see part of the stellar surface being blocked out from our view, so the whole thing appears less bright, give us two key elements, information on these new worlds on our cosmic horizon. The radio velocity gives us an estimate of its mass, and the transits gives us the radius of the planet. Of course, we need to know the star well enough because it's always proportional to the star, always proportional to what you might want to call their suns. And so to date, NASA has to count on 4,569 exoplanets, confirmed planets orbiting other stars in about 3,000 systems. So most planets are not alone. And we have more than 7,000, nearly 8,000 candidates that we're still vetting to make sure that there are no detector problems, that what we're seeing is really a signal of another world orbiting another star. But if you just take those numbers together, we're talking about 10,000 possible, or if you just want to take the first number, 5,000 new worlds 
that we are seeing out there. And so instead of there being one object, we now can do statistics. We can see patterns in the data. And even though we are biased because it's easier to find big and massive planets that are close to the star, we starting to see trends appear. And what we do see, the one key thing is we see a large diversity of exoplanets. And what I'm showing you here is the radius of the planets on the y-axis and the mass on the x-axis. And the mass and the radius are both in Earth's radius. So I've cut a couple off of the big planets. But what you see here is that we have a distribution and it seems to be up there on the right top corner, there's a blob that you see. And there seems to be a second blob that starts to come in here on the lower mass end. So where we're talking about one is of course an Earth's mass. So the two uh, lilac points are Venus and Earth that you see down here. But what you see is that they have company. And the color coding that I'm using here actually refers to how much light, how much energy from their star those planets get. And so you see that we're starting to get a really interesting distribution here. And if you now ask what kind of planets are those, we're getting to the point, if you have the mass and the radius that we can ask those questions, then you can say, well, if this planet were made out just of water, very unlikely, but the least dense material we can think of, so if it's just an ice ball, then the planet in this mass radius diagram would have to be under this topmost 100% H2L turquoise line. If it's 50% water, it's the next line down. And you can see Earth-like, a green line going through this graph. And so what you see here is that on this Earth-like graph, again, we don't know if it's Earth-like, but Earth density-like, you see that we have more and more of these objects. Some of them, the one in bright red, are very hot. Again, it's easier to find the close by ones, but some of them are actually quite cool and start to be very comparable in terms of how much energy they get and what their density is like to the Earth. What and what lets us enter a fascinating new era in actually knowing that there are worlds out there that are density-wise and flux-wise, how much energy they get, uh, pretty similar to ours. Of course, as we'll discuss in the next two and a half days, is there's a lot of other things that have to go right for life to start, we think. And then evolution is another fascinating, diverse issue that can lead life, if it were to evolve, to many different forms. And so one of the things that I wanted to show you in here is when you look at this, if you want to have a planet that is not much fluffier than just ice, then when you just have a look at all the data we have so far, you can see with your naked eye roughly that the line is somewhere around two Earth's radii. Below that, the planet is most likely a rock. Above that, it actually needs a lot of hydrogen in its atmosphere to account for this low density or for this big radius for a certain mass. So what you see here too is, even though you don't see two blobs here, that we have a kind of conglomerate of planets already down here in this Earth-like density range. And then we get one up here in what we call a mini Neptune range, where you have small gas balls. And these small gas balls in these really big Earth are nothing like in our solar system. We don't have any rocky planet bigger than Earth, and we don't have any gas planets smaller than Neptune. So by just looking outside to the cosmos and finding these worlds, we have discovered whole new types of planets that we didn't know existed in the first place. And that again, puts our solar system into context. And 
If you want to read more on how to characterize this habit of the planets, I'm just going to talk a little bit about it. There are a couple of review papers that are hopefully very accessible. Uh, I wrote one in 2017 on how to characterize habitable worlds, but there are several others that you see here um, that will catch you up with where the field is going. So the challenge is really you have an extrasolar planet, planet around another world. How can you actually identify one that might be a habitable world? And so if you think about a habitable world, first, you have to think about the basics to be able to assess where you could find it elsewhere too. So you kind of need a rock in space orbiting a star. A star. We orbiting the sun, other rocks orbit other stars. So it is heated, the earth is heated from the sun. Now, if there's no atmosphere, and here the picture of Mercury, then nothing much happens, really. The planet stays the same for billions of years. That same goes for moons. But if the rock is massive enough that it can actually have an atmosphere, so the gravity can hold on to gas that outgasses, then the gas moves around the planet and creates very interesting patterns, but also changes the planet itself. And liquids are possible. For the Earth, of course, that liquid would be water, but you can think about other liquids that could be possible, like, for example, on Titan's moon. And you can also have liquid to gas to solid, as you see, for example, on Mars. And again, the solar system we'll talk about a little bit more tomorrow. But if you then go even a step further, is if this is now a rock in space, it has an atmosphere, it's heated from the sun, we don't know what it takes for life to evolve there as well. If it evolves everywhere it can, then our chances to finding it soon are very good because we're just putting these big telescopes into space. The James Webb Space Telescope is starting by the end of this year and the extremely large telescopes are coming online in 2025. But this is one of the really interesting questions. Does life always have to start and how did it get started here on the earth? But what we do know on the earth is that it did get started and that it again changed our planet considerably. The oxygen we breathe, for example, right now is due to life inventing a new, world, new way of photosynthesis. So life, if it evolves, should change the planet considerably. And so with this idea in mind, let's have a look where we want to actually search. So you know the star, and you know that at a certain distance, it's so hot that all of the water will evaporate. And at another certain distance, it will be so cold that all of the water freezes up. So there's a distance that we call the Goldilocks or habitable zone. And that distance allows for surface water if the planet is similar to the Earth. Can be a bit more massive, can be a bit less massive, but basically similar to the Earth. So if you get too close, it's so hot that you start to lose all the oceans, you evaporate them away. If you get too cold, it's so frozen that all of it, even with a lot of CO2, will actually start to freeze out on your surface. So we have this distance range, this habitable zone for surface water, but it only will allow you to remotely detect life if it's there doesn't mean that life can be outside of these boundaries, maybe under frozen lakes, like what we want to look for in Europa and Enceladus and the frozen moons in our own solar system. But let's go for planets or moons that orbit other stars. If there is a huge ice layer on top of an ocean where life would develop or could develop, then we think that the gases won't make it to the, uh, to the air very easily. And if I can't go there and drill a hole in the ice, the air is everything I have. But I don't even need to go there, even if I'd like to go there, but I don't need to go to these new worlds to explore them because light travels the universe for free. But in this conference, we're talking also about the past, present, and future. So 
generally what happens, and this is a very complicated slide, but I just wanted to make the point that for the earth, we understand how much energy comes in from the sun, how much gets reflected back, how much gets absorbed, and thus why the earth is the temperature it is, and that we should not screw with adding so much more CO2 in our atmosphere to actually change that delicate balance. But there are several models out there, whether it's 1D, 2D, 3D, that you can use to do the same or something similar, assuming a certain composition for other worlds around other suns. But this habitable zone that I described, where it's not too hot and not too cold for liquid water to be possible on the surface is also temporary. It's a moment in time. So at the sun's current age of about 4.6 billion years, we are in it and we've also always been in it, the earth. But if you fast forward, and that's a lot of fast forward, so no worries there. We have about a billion years before we get shot to get into serious trouble without climate change, when just the sun will actually become more luminous and start to evaporate some of the water that we have on the oceans. But we have some time to figure out what to do or how to get off our planet in that respect. But in about 8 billion years, that's very far in the future, this habitable zone will actually not be around us, but it will be around Jupiter and Saturn and their icy moons. So it's a very interesting way of thinking about this habitability to actually not just be a certain zone in space, but also a certain stone certain zone in time. So if habitability changes or can change, and the signs that indicate that a planet is habitable can also change through time. So again, to this theme of our conference here, well, we only have one planet that we can use as our key or as a base for the exploration. And that's of course is Earth. So Let's use the Earth and try to figure out if there are spectral fingerprints on a habitable world or light signatures that we can look for. And if you go back a little in time to 1977, this has been Voyager 1 before it started its path out of our solar system, looked back and looked at the Earth. And this is the famous picture of the pale blue dot that Carl Sagan commissioned NASA to do. And you see this tiny dot suspended in a beam of sunlight here. And so technology has gotten a lot better since 1977, but we also want to do this for planets very far away. So if you have such a dot, you won't be able to actually expand it to see where the oceans are, where the continents are. But if you don't do that, but only suspend the white light into its colors, then you can read the combination of all of this, the life on the planet, the water on this world, the continents, in the light fingerprint, the spectra, the absorption features on this world. And if you look at the Earth, then the combination of ozone or oxygen with methane, a reducing gas, is our golden fingerprint for life. And so this is what it looks like in the infrared. You see the absorption features of water, of methane, of ozone, of CO2 here in the infrared region, it's just easier to show. And so what we really want is the combination of oxygen and a reducing gas or ozone and a reducing gas with water as a triple signature of this world could be very similar to ours. But when we go back in time, that signature has even changed a lot for the earth because our earth, if you look at it, if you looked at it, if you had a time machine that you can build because Einstein showed you can, but let's assume you were Doctor Who and you were actually traveling back in time, then you would always open the door off the TARDIS and you would come out into a kind of alien world because the Earth changed significantly since it was formed about 4.6 billion years ago. And we think the origin of life, well, we have indications for the origins of life 3.5 billion years ago, but it might have been earlier than that because the rock record is very hard to maintain that information in the rock record. 
but let's say 3.5 billion years. And if we take that whole life off the earth and we put it on a 24 hour clock, what you see is that around three o'clock in the morning, life got started. And then around lunchtime, roughly, oxygen starts to build up in the atmosphere. And why this is important is that the gases, as I said before, in the air of a planet is what we can actually observe to try to figure out whether or not there's life on another world or indications for biology. And so if you look at this, this is actually models of the Earth when it was young to when it is now. So 3.5 billion years ago on the lowest part, 2 billion years ago when oxygen started to build up in the middle part, and now. So what you see is that these absorption features where light hits a molecule, and instead of actually getting all the way to my telescope where I look, it actually interacts with that molecule by making it swing and rotate, and thus it doesn't arrive at my telescope. Thus, I see an absorption line, an absorption feature. I see that there's no light where there should be some. And going to the lab, I can figure out what molecule or what atom that light actually encountered on its path. And so what you see here, for example, is that currently we have a kind of deepish water uh, oxygen feature, O2, and then when you go back in time, that becomes smaller and smaller. And what you see in the background is an image of the extremely large telescope that will come online in Chile in the Atacama Desert and has a nearly 40 meter telescope diameter that will allow us to look at these small planets and scout their atmosphere for uh, interesting atmospheric compositions that we cannot explain with anything else but biology and other worlds. So if we go to the telescope that's gonna launch uh, end of this year on the 18th of December, the James Webb Space Telescope from NASA and ESA, what you see here is the same view, this different gases of the earth through geological times, our earth, what we understand for its comical composition through time. And you see here too, that you can see Again, this is about, uh, so the, the modern Earth is on top and the youngest Earth model here is on the bottom. You see that the ozone feature with the methane features that indicate life on Earth actually change in shape and intensity when you go back in time. So before the great oxidation event about 2.3 billion years ago, started somewhere around 2.7, there wasn't enough oxygen in the atmosphere for us to be able to tell that you're looking at biology. Life existed even before. That is not a question. We know that from the rock record, but initially it made chemicals like CO2 and methane that can also be made geologically. So there's only a part time of when life already existed on the earth that we could see it remotely if we can't go there and actually look at it and see that something is moving around. So there are some constraints, but those constraints actually help us. What you see here is to say, well, not all of these stars are actually yellow suns like ours. So if you have a small red sun, some features are much easier to find, like the methane feature. If you have an even hotter star than our own sun, then some other feature like the ozone feature are easier to find. And so, we can use all of this and prepare for this mission we are launching right now. And right here is one of our most interesting targets. It's called TRAPPIST-1E, and then the TRAPPIST system where we have seven Earth-sized planets orbiting a small red star. This is one of the top targets for the James Webb Space Telescope to try to figure out if we could find things like ozone, water and methane in its atmosphere. And there are a lot of teams all around the world working on that to try to give us a first insight into what these worlds can be like. But the other worlds in our solar system, whether it's planets or moons, also give us part of the puzzle, not for habitable worlds per se, but for comparison. And if you ever wanted to play around, there are these spectral fingerprints, these 
spectra from planets and moons in our own solar system and from models of the Earth through time or other planets that are freely available at the Carl Sagan Institute. Uh, feel free to use them and hopefully they provide a good tool to find interesting signs with the upcoming mission. But let me go further. So there's this catalog of spectra that we model on Earth, that we model on the solar system. Um, but what about life on Earth? Life on Earth is incredibly changing. If you just go back a couple of million years, you don't talk about big plants and trees anymore. So you talk farms, you talk mosses. And before that, you talk cyanobacteria. So our world, if you were to see it, opening the door of the TARDIS or another time machine that can't exist, would be an incredibly alien world to you. And so life on the Earth is incredibly diverse. And here I just picked two cases. One of them here on the right is the tardigrade. That is one of the best space travels we have encountered so far. But if life were just a little bit different, evolution could have gone a very different route. And we'll talk about this a bit later today too. So I think it's very important to actually keep your eyes open and your mind open to not miss signs of life out there just because we are too focused on a carbon copy of our own world. And so what I uh, thought was really interesting to do is to collect as much diverse kinds of life as possible and see how that would appear to our telescope. This is where I got this blue world, this red world, this yellow world from. And it's again, this database of life is freely available at the Carl Sagan Institute. And if you have a kind of life form we haven't measured and you want us to measure it, please just send it our way and use the data any way you want. There's 137 different kinds of biota already in our database, and we love to have more. But it just reminds us that life, when we're looking for it, is this wide range, this huge arch. And so we should keep our eyes and mind open in our search and use everything we know about the earth to actually be better in searching for any kind of life out there. And this, for example, is a recent picture of NASA for an ocean biofluorescent bloom. And so on other worlds, maybe ocean worlds, the signatures like such, like biofluorescence might actually be beneficial, especially if you're under harsh irradiation, for example, a young red sun. So there are other signs of life that we shouldn't forget. And as the last point that I wanted to bring in here, because we're talking about the search for life, not only about what we already know from the earth, but also about what's going on in its future, is what about if we switch? Let me switch your perspective for the last couple of minutes. If there were an alien civilization out there, not saying there is, but if there were, and they had just the exact same technology information that we had or savvy that we have right now, who could be able to see us if anywhere we're looking? And so what we use is the Gaia data, the European Space Agency has this amazing Gaia mission up there that tracks the position of billions of stars through time. And we said, okay, to be able to see the Earth as a transiting planet, where it blocks out part of the light from the host star, like we found about 7% of all the exoplanets out there by looking at the blocking out of the light from its host star, who would be at the right spot to see us? And the stars, you see this white line here of stars is basically the ones that would be able to spot us with that technology. So that technology is pretty simple. I'm not saying you couldn't develop more technology, but the question was, are there any stars that actually could spot us that way? And it turns out we have 2000, a bit more than 2000 stars that actually, if you go back and forth about 5,000 years in time, because again, um, that we're going through, uh, through time in our exchange. It's not just who could see us right now, but who could have seen us in the past. 
when humankind started to develop, the civilization started to bloom. And then being an optimist, I'm going 5,000 years into the future, hopefully a lot more. And so you actually have about 2,000 stars that could have spotted us that way if it had planted around them and anybody looking. And this again is freely available. Pick your most favorite stars or pick all the stars and look for planets around them. Because it turns out that these stars are, well, very normal in the ecliptic. So they're in a region of the sky where there are a lot of stars. So we haven't really probed that region or searched them for planets around other stars because it's harder to find them in crowded fields, these planets, than not. But now we have a reason to go look. And I know that the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, so SETI, has already started to look at some of the targets. And we use radio waves since about 100 years. So those radio waves have been able to actually wash over about 75 of the stars in our list already. And we have seven known exoplanets hosts currently in that list. And there should be about 500 if the statistic holds everywhere, because we know one out of five stars has a planet like our own, potentially like our own, has a planet at the right distance and not too big uh, uh, and not too small, so that it should be a rock like the Earth. And so some of them even have planets that we know orbit within the Harvard zone. And some of them have seen us already. And some of them, of them like the TRAPPIST-1 system, will only be seeing us in about 2,000 years with that method. So NASA's test mission that is currently looking at these planets is actually looking at this region of the sky, trying to find new planets in that um, area. And one of the headlines of the newspaper when we published this that I liked was at least 2,034 ways Earth has blown its cover. And so hopefully where we are, this threshold that we have now reached of finding these other planets and now having the first telescopes that can look into their atmosphere and try to figure out if there are signs we cannot explain other than life is the threshold of when you can start to find life in the universe. Because I think it is exciting to live in a time where we can make that step. Also in a time where we'll try to actually reach the next star. But what we do in all this search is to actually get to know our own planet better and better. And that is also key for our survival. I'm not saying we're going on a spaceship to the next planet and live there. That's going to be hugely far off, especially for 7 billion people. But with every other Earth-like planet that we see out there, that we find out there, we can start to understand our own planet better and better and safeguard it better so that we will be around to do this future exploration. And again. I think about it sometimes as a history book, the history book of the future, the time before or when humankind was wondering whether or not they were alone in the universe and the time after. And I think we have a very good shot at living currently in the time where if life exists everywhere it can, we can figure that out. And with that thought, and with thousands of diverse worlds that we already encountered and still have to understand with the upcoming missions, uh, I will leave you to think about how you could maybe come up with something that we haven't thought about yet, what we should be looking for. And then feel free to reach out to me and send me your email or send me any kind of biota that you would like us to measure if it could be on other worlds out there. Because we're starting the search with the James Webb and the extremely large telescope coming online, telescopes coming online. And I think it's an exciting search and hopefully we'll get lucky. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa, for that uh, wonderful and exciting and very thought-provoking uh, talk. Um, we have a, a couple of questions already, but I just wanted to remind everybody once again to, to please type in your questions 
using the Q&A button at the bottom of your, of your screen. Um, and uh, as uh, was mentioned in the, uh, in the introduction to the conference, you can also upvote other people's questions uh, if you see a question that you yourself uh, would very much like to see uh, answered. Um, Lisa, the, the first question comes from Louis Friedman, um, who asks about the detectability of life on other worlds prior to an oxygenation event. Um, is, is oxygenation particularly important for the detect detectability of, of basic forms of life on, on other worlds, or is there a potential to, to detect the life earlier than that? So there is the potential, of course, to see signs of life earlier, like CO2 and methane, but the problem is it's not a unique sign. This is where the problem comes in. So I'll be able to say, ooh, this is intriguing, but I'll have other explanations, geological explanations, like, for example, for the methane on Mars detection, where we know of a lot of geological explanations too for methane. And because these planets are so far away, I won't be able to go there and actually make some other uh, investigations, like actually have a look if there's somebody walking around there. So what we need is extraordinary evidence, as Carl Sagan said, for extraordinary discoveries. So we on the very conservative side, when we had on the earth, the oxygenation event, the great oxygenation event, then you start to have this combination of oxygen with a reducing gas like methane. And the important part of that is that oxygen plus methane would react to CO2 and water if it weren't replenished all the time. And so that you see it's still in the atmosphere together tells you that something produces it in huge quantities. And for oxygen, the only uh, explanation we have, huge quantity, when there's methane around, is life, if it's not a super hot planet. And so basically, that's how we're going to have our proof, but we're going to make it extremely conservative. So long story short, I will be intrigued by planets with a lot of CO2 and a lot of methane, but I won't be able to tell, to tell you that there's a telltale science for life. But hopefully what we'll get is a lot of planets with different kinds of signatures so we can see patterns. But again, a telltale sign is something we cannot explain with anything else but life. Interesting, great, thank you very much. Um, one other question came in from Graziano Chiaro um, asking specifically about Tea Garden B um, and its potential habitability uh, and what we might expect. Uh, for, for life if, if it exists on that planet. I think what was really interesting when we did this idea about who could see us and when could they have seen us before or after is that we found several exoplanets holes and Tea Garden B is one of them. And um, I think if I remember correctly, Tea Garden B can see us in about 29 years with this technology. And so that's kind of really interesting. So we kind of have three... Uh, three decades to get ready for an inspection if anybody were to look with this method from T. Dark at Garden B. And to be honest, when uh, we talk about these worlds, there is an amazing, an amazing, and I love it, um, artist impression of many of these worlds out there. But the knowledge we have is the density of the planet, roughly for most of them, so roughly, or the size, and then we basically can say, okay, below two Earth radii, we don't know a planet that is not an Earth, or like not a rocky composition. But other than that, the only thing you would know is the color of the sun in the sky, and then the artist impressions come in, where you get like beautiful rocky landscapes or ocean landscapes, but to be honest, we don't know if those hold. We need much more information. We need these big telescopes to actually get the light from these planets, whether it's Tea Garden B or any of the other ones, to see whether there is actually water vapor in the atmosphere or whether there is a huge haze of CO2 over this planet or a huge hydrogen atmosphere that makes it more weird in a way. And so Everything I can tell you what would be going on on Tea Garden B would be a guess, uh, and not even a very educated guess at this point, but on the 18th of December, we're flying the James Webb Space Telescope. And so for some of these planets, especially the ones that transit, and so uh, 
they uh, will actually get much more information hopefully soon. Again, it's going to be super hard. Don't expect like um, detailed pictures, but at least the composition of the atmosphere is something that we should get to for some of them. Um, amazing. Um, well, that's a fantastic segue, Lisa, into actually a question that I had, which I'll, I'll take the chair's prerogative to ask. Um, so both uh, Dr. Pete Warden and yourself mentioned the James Webb Space Telescope and its upcoming launch uh, here in a few weeks. And I'm wondering if you could maybe tell us what uh, observation that James Webb will make you are most excited uh, about seeing. What observing campaign do you think is is, is most interesting? What data are you waiting to, to get a look at? So saying that I am a planet, who, uh, a person who loves exoplanets, I have to say that because there's a lot of exciting things James Webb is going to do for us, is I'm really excited and part of the team that's going to look at the TRAPPIST-1 planets. So there is an observation campaign, they transit, so they go in front of the star. And thus, with James Webb, we want to collect the light that gets filtered from the star through the atmosphere when that transit happens, before it gets to the James Webb add up that signal, it's not going to be just one transit, we'll actually have to add them up puzzle piece wise, one transit after another, and then get enough signals to tease out whether or not these worlds have water vapor, or CO2, or methane, and then of course, methane and oxygen, if at all possible. And so that's what I'm personally most excited about, but I promise I will be also very excited if we find super exciting things in the solar system or around black holes and galaxies. That's just my honest answer. 